Hey, hey, welcome back to the Girl Be Free podcast. I'm your host, Siobhan, your community cultivator and founder of Be Free Project. I help women who are ready to flourish, feel fulfilled, and be free to show up for themselves. I am deeply passionate about community, sisterhood, and personal growth. So if that's your jam, keep on listening. And now let's get into the show. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Girl Be Free podcast. I'm your host, Siobhan, and I'm excited to be bringing you back another Chasing Free feature. Today, I'm interviewing Stacy Flowers. She's a TEDx talk speaker, self-made entrepreneur, eternal optimist and mom dedicated to helping women create authentic, fulfilled, happy lives. She's been named the next global leader for her generation and listed number one on the top 10 list of female motivational speakers. Known as the mentor in your head because of her refreshing, authentic approach to connect with audiences everywhere. Stacy has a unique ability to educate, empower, and inspire audiences worldwide. She believes self-development is the greatest world-changing tool on the planet and everyone can benefit from it. Stacy holds a bachelor's degree, in paralegal studies from the College of St. Mary and a master's in human resources from Loyola University, Chicago. Her greatest joy has been raising her soon to be 18 year old son. Stacey, welcome to the Girl Be Free podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I am beyond so excited. excited. This, this is going to be a. Oh. <laughs> we I know we're both so excited, excited to talk. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And it's like this episode is long overdue because we've been trying to do it for so long. So I know today is going to be perfect, especially where our energy is. So yeah. as we get into the show, my very first question I want to ask is how is your heart and how are you feeling today? Oh, <laughs> um, my heart is very, very full and I am feeling very loved and very fulfilled in my life. Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And what inspired you to begin to create the life that you want? Um, okay, so we're gonna it's gonna take a little dip. Um, the thing that inspired me to create the life that I want, honestly, was devastation. And um, Tony Robbins talks about how people are moved to change, or people are moved to create the life that they want by one or two things: either inspiration or devastation. And mine was definitely the latter. Um, do you want me to go into it or you want? Yeah. Okay. So at the top of 2017, um, or let's say a little bit before 2017, I was on a high. I had delivered a TED talk. I was traveling to countries. Um, I was just doing the thing that I felt like I was born to do. And then at the top of 2017, I plummeted because I experienced something called nervous exhaustion and essentially went into deep, deep depression, like overwhelming anxiety and, um, severe post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. And when that happened, um, over time, I just started to lose everything. I wasn't able to work. I was barely able to get out of bed. And so I lost two companies that I had at the time, my family home, um, my faith community, my health, uh, physically, mentally, and emotionally, like all of these things just started to just crumble around me. And I just remember being in the bed and not really being able to get out and just thinking like, how could I go from the highest high of my life to such a deep low in a relatively short period of time? Like I must be doing something wrong. Like I must be doing life wrong. And so I was just like, okay, if I'm ever to get up out of this situation or get up out of this circumstance, like I'm going to get up and I'm going to do life my way. And that sort of created the impulse to make sure that I was creating the life that I actually wanted versus the life that I thought I was supposed to have or the life that I should want based off what other people wanted for me. Mm, there's so <laughs> like, there's so much in that because a lot of times, like when you're going through like post-traumatic stress disorder, any devastation mm -hmm. like that, like to get back on your feet, like yeah. what was happening in your mindset to even know, okay, this is traumatic right now, but I need to move forward. I need to figure out how to get out of this. The the big thing that was happening is that my outside life just didn't match how I was feeling on the inside. And I tell people all the time, when what you think your life is supposed to look like and what it actually feels like don't match, it's time to talk to a therapist. Mm -hmm. And so I just remember like being in the bed and I'm just like, I this is this is wrong. Like this doesn't fit. This doesn't make any sense. Like this can't be my life. This can't be my life. And um, because of like the, the PTSD symptoms I had, the PTSD and the anxiety, there was a little bit of fear around like going out of the house and, and just doing normal things. But I, 
it within the space of like my bed, I still had access to my phone and stuff. And I'm like, okay, my life isn't matching, which lets me know that I'm in a state of trauma because my life is supposed to match. My thoughts and my feelings are supposed to have some form of alignment. And if they don't have immediate alignment, I should at least be able to think through how to get them to a place of alignment. And I know that that's not happening now. So I know I need to talk to a professional. And so while I was like laying right there in the bed, like I Googled on psychology today, therapists in the Chicago area who specifically deal with PTSD because I knew it was a trauma response. I had been diagnosed with PTSD some years earlier. um, And so I knew I was in the middle of trauma and not just depression or anxiety. And so I immediately reached out to a therapist and she gave me like a brief session there over the phone. And within the week I had an appointment and I started going. That was my, my first big step because I was just like, this isn't this isn't something spiritual. This isn't something that my mom can help me with. This isn't something a friend can help me with. Like I, it was, it was devastatingly overwhelming. And I knew that a therapist would be the first step out. So I started talking to a therapist and she gave me the space to be able to express my thoughts and feelings. And slowly but surely, um, I began to rebuild my life, but it took a long time. I didn't work for that full year of 2017. Um, And then when I did start working again, I started working part-time because I truly didn't have the mental or emotional capacity to be anybody's full-time employee. Like at the top, you heard my bio about having a master's and a bachelor's. It's like, none of that matters when you don't have your mental and emotional health. And so I didn't even go to work doing work that I was educated to do. I went and I worked part-time at a cafe serving lattes. Um, And I did that for a while until I was able to rebuild my company and slowly but surely just reestablish things. But it all started with me recognizing that the way that I thought my life was supposed to be, it didn't feel that way. And I needed a professional to help me navigate a space out of that. And I love that because self-awareness is so important and I don't think people value it enough. Mm -hmm. And when, like you said, like the inside was not matching the outside. Like we have to pay attention to that. Like that is so important. And I had a similar experience for me when I realized like something was off, like something Mm -hmm. is not right. And I tried to fix it on my own, going to church, doing all the things. None of that was working. Like the Mm -hmm. preacher can pray for however long, but that was not working for me. And when I went to therapy, it was almost like this light bulb moment I had or whatever. And it was like, oh, I really need some help. Like, yeah. Th- yeah. Therapy was the thing that taught me that there's a difference between what is normal and what's natural. And it is kind of normal to ha- like think your life is supposed to be a certain way, but it feels completely different. That's normal. Like most people will walk around saying that they're for the most part unsatisfied, unfulfilled. Um, and that's just life. They'll be like, oh, well, you know, that's life. And so that's pretty normal, but it's not natural. That's not our natural state. And for me, one of the reasons why I'm convinced that it's not our natural state is because like I had a, um, I had my son when I was 17 or I got pregnant when I was 17. I had him when I was 18. And from the moment that I found out I was having a child, like my number one desire for him was for him to have a good life, a happy life, a joyous life. Never ever was I like, you know what? I want your life to be mediocre and I want what you think your life is supposed to be and what your life actually feels like to not match. No, like I've done everything in my power as a mom to put him in environments and give him opportunities so that he could actually live a good life so he could have joy, so he could have peace, so he could have like integrity within himself. And so when I find myself not living that or I find so many people comfortable with not having joy or happiness or integrity within themselves. I'm like, when did you learn that that was okay? And when did that become normal? Like when did normal become better than what's natural? Cause our natural state is joy. If you see a kid playing, I mean, come on, nobody had to teach that kid to do that, but we are educated out of our joy. We're educated out of our happiness. And it's just like, I refuse to live a normal life anymore, especially if I know that it means giving up who I am naturally and um, therapy was the thing that brought that to my attention. And I was like, oh, normal is overrated. I will live naturally. And my yes. natural state is quite joyous, mm-hmm. quite optimistic, very peace, like ease. That is my natural state. And anytime I don't feel that, then it's time for me to get some support. And I really hope people are paying attention. Like if they're, if you are battling something internally, like you have to pay attention to that. And it mm-hmm. can be therapy. Maybe it's picking up a book. Maybe it's journaling. Maybe it's reaching out to a friend and having a conversation, but you mm-hmm. have to do something like, I agree, like our natural state, like we should be joyous. We There should be bliss. There should be happiness. It should not be this 
mundane type of life where you're just existing, going through the motions and you're mm-hmm. suffering in pain. Like that yeah. is not living. And so mm-hmm. many people are doing that every single day. And it's why we do the work that we do. And hopefully yeah. this conversation will inspire people to at least look within, like look within yes. yourself and see what should I be doing? Because this feeling that I'm feeling is not okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I know therapy was your, like the, thing that kind of moved you to get out of the rut that you were in? Well, what Mm -hmm. other personal growth resources did you use to begin to shift your life? Mm -hmm. Um, So my first, so when I got on the path to to personal growth, my first thing was a book and it was the book by Louise L. Hay, You Can Heal Your Life. Mm -hmm. I love that book, highly recommend it. Um, And it was the first time that I had read anything that helped me to understand and connect my thinking to the results that I had in my life. So before getting on the path to personal growth and development, I kind of just thought that everybody was dealt a hand and you had to figure out how to play your hand. Like it was spades. Like you might have a losing hand, but if you and your partner can figure it out, y'all might be able to go wheels and just, you know, shut the whole thing down. I, that's how I thought life was. But then I was just like, oh no, life isn't you being dealt a hand. Life is literally you creating what you want to see in the world. And I mean that... And now intuitively on the inside, I thought that that's how life was. Cause you know, as a kid, you have an imagination. So you think you can create anything, Mm -hmm. but then you grow up and you're like, oh no, you got to play this hand. And when I read that book, I was like, oh, I don't have to play this hand. I don't have to, any of the illnesses, whether they be mental, emotional, physical, financial, any sort of lack, weakness, illness in my life. I can just create something else. Like I literally can create how my creator creates. It blew my whole entire mind. And when I started to really think about what I was thinking about versus just thinking what I was taught to think it, everything began to change. It just, it shifted dramatically. So that was my first, first introduction. And then I was just like, do other people know this? And so then I started to find other teachers and probably my favorite personal growth and development teacher um, is the late Dr. Wayne Dyer. Like I love his work. He is profound in the way that he makes very complex life experiences simple enough for you to be able to digest and take right action for you so you can produce the results that you really want to have in your life. I love that. Now, Mm -hmm. okay, so therapy and Mm -hmm. then the book by Louise Mm -hmm. Hay. Are there any other, I know you love journaling, so that's why I'm like, yeah, like, so (laughs) so how has, that's what I'm actually trying to pull out. So how has journaling impacted your life in addition to the other resources? Right. So journaling was the companion. So when I started reading the book in order for me to like hold on to the way that it was shifting my beliefs and shifting my understanding is I had to write it down. Like, Mm so it's one thing to consume, but if you never express, like you're not sensitive synthesizing you're not actually digesting that information and what I like to tell people is that like 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 it exists on three different levels right we have information we have knowledge and we have wisdom so information is the book that you pick up but it doesn't become knowledge until it becomes known to you and you don't know if it's known to you until you express it in some way whether it's you journaling which I think is the best way because then you can really see your thoughts or it's you expressing it out loud to someone else but then there's this other level that comes after knowledge which is wisdom and wisdom is the application of the knowledge but what people like to do is they like to take information and skip to wisdom before they've allowed allowed it to be known to them. But journaling is the process of allowing information to become known to you. When I look back at my journals and I'm like, oh my gosh, Stacey, like you used to believe this. And I know you did because you wrote it down. And this is like, you, 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 took this concept that she shared and you tried to articulate it in your own words and you wrote this down. And now looking back a decade later, I'm like, it makes no sense to me now, but had I not done that, it wouldn't have become, it wouldn't have become a part of something that I knew. It just would have been information that I was trying to apply haphazardly. But it's just like, I win today because I did, I took in the information in order. I took it from information to knowledge to wisdom. So now when something comes up, I don't have to necessarily go back to her book because I actually digested it via writing it in my journal. Yes. I'm hoping that 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 No, and I I do get it. And it's like, it's living in your soul, like because you (laughs) consumed it and now you're Mm -hmm. processing it and now you're taking action on it. And I do feel like, and I'm guilty of that where I would skip that middle step. And I don't think I've ever heard it expressed that way, but I journal as well, but I don't know, like, it's almost like when I read the four agreements, I'm like, okay, I got to put this into action right away. But it's like, wait, how are you taking things personally? Yes. How are you making these yes. assumptions? How is this showing up in your life? And then once you kind of process and work through that, it's like, yes. oh, this is what I need to do. But I don't think that we are... Go ahead. 
then the, then the resource that you use doesn't become a crutch. So no book is designed to be a crutch, but until you put it in a journal, until you process it, it will be your crutch. And it's that middle, people skip that middle step and then they wonder why they can't keep up the habits. They wonder why they can't keep up the change. It's like, I process what I consume. And if it's good for me, I go ahead and digest it and, you know, exp- shifted into wisdom and if it's not good for me i leave it right there on the table like but yeah it's that you have to do that middle step it's like yeah that's this i love how you said that with the four agreements because i love that book too oh, it's my favorite book my favorite book yeah. um all right so how do you show up for yourself and do the work and then what does the work actually look like for you Ooh, these questions <laughs> these are good questions um okay so i think the way that i've learned to show up for myself is that I have made myself my favorite human on the planet. So like I I love myself the most. And that used to be something that I was very afraid to say out loud, but I realized that like, if I don't love myself the most, there's really nothing, especially with the work that I feel like I've been called to do. There's not much that I'm going to be able to do for the people I've been called to serve or people in my family, my friends, et cetera. Um, So I think the way that I show up is making sure that I remain my favorite person. And I do that by like checking in with myself and making sure that I'm living in accordance with my values and making sure that every day I'm touching something that's important to me. Like I don't let a week go by without touching or speaking to the people who matter to me the most, stuff like that. So, but I do that as a result of making myself my favorite person. And then, you know, in me, doing that, there's like this incredible deeper level of self-love that just naturally happens. And out of that choices to make the investment in therapy or make the investment in a trainer or make the investment in a rest practice. Um, And I've mentioned my rest practice before that I rest seven by seven by seven by seven, which means every seven days I take a day off. Every seven weeks I take a week off. Every seven months I take a month off and every seven years I'll take a year off. And so I, I create rituals and practices and I invest in, in people and tools and resources that are specifically designed for me. Like they're not for any other reason than that they make me better. Like my therapist is for me. My trainer is for my body. My, my coach is for my, they're, they're a thousand percent for me. Um, and in each of these different practices that I do, it's like they require a level of work and I either use the person who I'm going to get the support from to hold me accountable or the actual work that they give me. I use that as the, the, the map for, okay, well, this is the work that you're going to be doing today. But I think for me, it rooted in me really seeing that like I had to become the most important person to me over everyone that, and and that even includes my son, which is used to be something that was very, I mean, it's still a little sticky to admit out loud, but in hindsight, looking back, I can see how it was the best decision because hit the fruit that he's bearing now as he's transitioning into manhood and stuff like that. I'm like, Oh, that wouldn't have been there if you made him more important than you. You had to put your mask on first. Like you had to take care of yourself so that you had enough oxygen to be able to take care of him. And so many women are guilty of putting their kids before themselves. And I did an episode recently titled 12 things that I'm afraid to tell you. And I wanted to things that I shared was that I do not feel guilty for putting myself first. My kids don't come before me. Now, I was guilty of doing that years ago, Mm -hmm. but now, no, absolutely not. Um, So were you always your favorite person or is that something that you learned over time? That's something that I learned over time. And it's actually really new. Like I probably became my favorite person within like the last three years. So before that, like there were so many other people that were before me. Like it wasn't even just a person, like my family was my favorite period. So they came before me. Um, There was a time where my son was my favorite and even just different romantic partners. Um, It took a while to learn that that was the position that I was supposed to hold in my own life. Um, So yeah, no, it took a, it took, it took a long while. And I think maybe because I became a mom so young. So I started at, as soon as I became an adult, I was also already responsible for someone. So I was all very early on divided in the ability to be able to become a favorite because I didn't have enough time to really kind of get to know myself independent of being someone's mom. Um, So those very early years, I I don't even think I liked myself, let alone to be my favorite. Because that's the thing, like when you think about your favorite, you kind of got to like that person. And I like myself so much now um, in ways that I just, I definitely did not like myself before. 
Yeah, and I love that because even when you talk about the 777, like that is showing so much love to yourself, like mm -hmm. to rest. Like, and we talk about this all the time, like your whole resting period. And I never heard a process like that prior to you sharing it on your morning show, but it mm -hmm. makes so much sense because we don't pour into ourselves enough. And even yeah. taking a break from all of the work that we do, whether mm -hmm. you're working in corporate or you're working for yourself, it requires rest or we will yeah. burn out. It does. And people don't understand that some of the things that they don't have in their life is because they're tired. Like when I realized, I was like, oh, that's why I'm cranky. It's because I'm tired. It's like, you know how like little kids like need a nap and you're yes. like, oh, a nap will change a whole mm -hmm. attitude and an mm -hmm. attitude will change your life, you know? Yes. So when I realized that I was just like, well, not only do I give 150 million percent, no matter the job that I'm doing. And it's funny because so many people would comment on that. And when I used to work in corporate America or when I was a waitress, or whatever like people would all, they'd be like you don't you don't have to put all this in there I'm like but you, I want to do it right it's just who I am I mm -hmm. like to give 110 percent but it's just like I do that in everything that I'm doing and so it's not a luxury for me to rest it's a necessity if I'm gonna give a hundred percent then I also need time to recover from that and when I learned that like I'm better like attitude emotionally just presence etc when I take a day off when I take it like I, I was like oh I don't know why everybody doesn't do this you're mm -hmm. just cranky because you're tired like you're actually a tired human being and if you just restore yourself you'd be surprised at what you're able to produce so why do you think women have a problem with resting like really like doing yeah. that like why do you think that that's a problem well, a couple of things. I think, you know, there more women nowadays are doing things that we just weren't doing before. And whether we want to believe it or not, in the back of our minds, we're still kind of competing with men. Um, and even though we're on the tail end of competing with men, when we started competing with them, I mean, it's a lot of work to complete, compete with men, period. Um, and now that we're on the tail end, we're competing with each other. Yeah, <laughs> and in you competing with each other, it's like, I can't take a break because if I take a break, then she's going to win. And if she wins, then that means that I'm going to lose. And I mm. think so long as you have the mindset that there's a winner and a loser, oh, you you think I'm a rest? You think I'm no, like I can't rest in this parenting thing. My child has to be better than your kids. And we may never say this out loud, but yeah. our actions, the things that we're doing, it shows that we feel like we're playing in a game where there are winners and there are losers and nobody wants to be a loser. So I think that competition things that we entered the game of just showing up fully as women competing with men um, and now competing with women. So that's one thing. And then I think the second thing is that busy has been glorified. It's like, yes. if you're not busy, then you're not winning. Maybe it's all winning. Hmm. Um, it, but you know, it's like, if you're not busy, what are you even doing? Like how, how dare you have time? Like what me? I'm busy. That's how, you know, I'm a boss. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. You know how you know I'm a boss? My the paychecks. Come that on. I sign. Come on. Like, that's yes. How, that's how I know I'm a boss. Like yes. busy is not the indication of bossness. And I think somewhere along the lines that became a badge. That became um, it became the thing that we used as so that's that's the second one. Is busy became a badge, right? I think the third thing, and this is something that I had to realize, is that we also don't rest because we don't like our lives. So if we rest and we slow down long enough, we'll realize that we don't like our lives and nobody wants to face that. So it's easier to just stay busy and just keep having stuff to do because if I had enough time to really think about it, I don't know if I would be hanging out with these friends. Come on. I don't know if I would stay in this career. I don't know if I would live in this house. I don't know. And nobody wants to, you know, upset the apple cart. So the busyness is a means of escape, mm -hmm. um, uh, escaping the realities of a life that you don't want. Because I'm telling you, when you're fulfilled and somebody is just like, hey, you want to take a day off? You're like, yes, yes it would yes. be wonderful to just not do anything. Most people can't do anything because to not do anything would be to be flooded with the reality that you don't like anything that you've created. So I would that say those so, three things. And that is so true because even like being this whole pandemic, yep. Light bulbs have been going off, you know, as it relates to people and how they're showing up in their lives. And my hope is that there's an awareness there like, oh, these are areas of my life that I do not like and I need to do something about it yeah. versus ignore it and get caught right back up into that busyness. Right. The, the way that I think of it, especially like given the pandemic, it's like some people are treating the pandemic like they're in a timeout, right? Mm -hmm. And some people mm -hmm. are treating it like they get more recess. Mm. But 
that's all in your mind, right? Both of those are breaks. Both of those are an adjustment. Both of those are time away from an activity, but so many people are treating it like they're in a timeout. It's like, oh, I don't want to be in this timeout. I want to, like, I've been taken away from my favorite toy because I've done something. It's like, this isn't timeout. This is more recess. Yes. Like, and don't get me wrong. I, there, I have so much compassion for, you know, fluctuation in income. You know, if you've lost your job, just different things like that. I'm not saying that those things are not challenging, but the idea of being at home, that the, the home that you selected, the house that you chose with the curtains that you hung up and the furniture mm-hmm. that you picked out. And the family and the kiddos, you have. Right? Yeah. And the kiddos that yeah. you gave birth to and the spouse that you chose, the idea that that feels like a time out from the things that you really want to do versus a little bit more time to play at recess is a thing that should be evaluated, mm-hmm. right? It's a thing yeah. that should be evaluated because that is your life. And if you don't like it, you are the only one who's going to be able to change it. And it doesn't require burning the whole thing down to the ground, but it is going to require you to do some heavy lifting and some work that most people just don't want to do. And so we stay busy, especially women. Yep. And they're going to miss this women. moment. They're going to miss it mm-hmm. and they're going to get caught up right back into the rhythm that they had before and mm-hmm. kick themselves years down the line. Why didn't I shift something? Whatever that shift may look yeah. like. I would hope that there will be a change. And I know there will be for some people, but a lot of people are going to go right back to the same old thing that they were doing before, which is very sad. Mm-hmm. Um, so what's your biggest fear and how do you overcome your fears? <laughs> um, hmm. This is a good question. I will say, hmm. What, what my biggest fear was, was the fear of success. Mm-hmm. That was my biggest fear. And I overcame that by talking about it all the time. Um, I, so, oh man, yeah. So my biggest fear was success. And yeah, I think that it was, okay. It wasn't just that I talked about it. What it is, is that, okay, anytime I fear anything, I try to face it like with my eyes wide open. And what I mean by that is like so many times when we're afraid of something, like we close our eyes metaphorically or literally, and whatever we imagine becomes bigger than the fear itself, right? So what I used to imagine about what would happen when I was successful is has been way worse than the actual experience of success. So I kind of had to like open my eyes and really look at, okay, what are you actually afraid of? Like this idea, this big thing of success, it's like, what about success are you afraid of? And when I opened my eyes and looked at it, it wasn't just success in general. It was the idea that if I was successful, then my friend group would change because they weren't as successful and then I maybe wouldn't belong. And so I had to face my fear around not belonging to my original friend group. Um, It was the idea that people who needed me in the past when I wasn't as successful as I am now, they would need more and I would be depleted. So I had to face that and say, okay, well, that's on you. You need to put some boundaries up. So I think that what I do, no matter what fear I'm facing is I try my best to open my eyes so that I can see it for what it really is and stop imagining it bigger and worse. And the way that I do the opening of my eyes is to talk about it. So like on my podcast, I did a whole series about fear of success. I, you know, worked through a lot of it with my therapist. I journaled about it. Um, but I think, I think speaking the fear helped me to like acknowledge it and just see it for what it is. In terms of present fears, I don't have any present fears um, that I'm that I'm consciously aware of. I don't. I think that that was my last big fear was to face my fear of success, but no present fears um, at this moment. I have some. I have some fears that are a, a little bit more wrapped around trauma, but I, they're not. They're not like conscious fears of like, oh, this is the thing that I'm afraid of. It's more of a trauma sort of response, subconscious sort of a thing. And it, they come up rarely, but for those, I'm just managing those with therapy. Mm-hmm. And you know what? So many people can relate to being afraid to succeed, mm-hmm. but can't mm-hmm. articulate that that is what they're feeling, nor do they, do they have yeah. the words to say, okay, this is the reason I'm afraid of success because what is the outcome that's going to come once I hit this level of success? So for you to be able to break it down like that, I think is really key. Um, That's a fear. Let me see. Is that still a fear of mine? I don't think it's a fear of mine now, but it definitely was because my thing was always, what if I can't keep up with the demand that's going to come as a result of getting to this certain place? And it's like, oh, but 
God has always kept you and you got this far. So if you got this mm -hmm. far, then you'll be able to have the resources, the people and everything that you need for the next area or the next level. But I love how, I love how you say that. Like God has always had you. And I had to realize that I believe that God would be there when things were bad, but I didn't believe that he would be there when things were good. And so there was so much fear that goodness meant less God. And I had to reconcile that. Like that was a really big thing. Cause I was like, oh my gosh, what if I don't need God anymore? I'm so successful. But it's just like, that's not a thing. That's yeah. not a thing. You'll need them in a different way. Like there's a level of success that I have now where when I'm turning to God is to get comfort because there is difference with me being here and more people that I know not being here with me. But it's just like that comfort is no different than when I was going through something really dark and hard. And I was like, God, can you comfort me? And so that was, that was a part of it. I was just like, Oh, if, if I don't need him for anything, will I turn to him anymore? And so reconciling that was very, very helpful in me dealing with my fear of success. That's really good. So tell mm -hmm. me what is the most important thing that you have learned about yourself this year? <laughs> <laughs> well are we are we allowed to use curse words you can do as you please my friend <laughs> do as you please say what you and i know what you are about to say I carry on i already know okay clutch your clutch your pearls and put your earmuffs on but i the thing that i learned this year is that I am the best me for me and everyone else when I do what the fuck I want to do. You better come on. That's come on. I love it. I'm here for I, it. That is a hundred percent. I did not. Why don't you say it know. again, please? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am the best for me and for everyone I love when I do what the fuck I want to do. And it's, it took a, it took, I mean, I, I don't even know how to begin to describe how important it is that I learned that lesson. I did not know that doing what I want to do is the game. It is the secret ingredient to my business success. So many people have been watching that. Like it's because I do what I want to do. Like it's the secret to, you know, the success even of my son and you know, where he's at, like it, it is the secret ingredient. It is the sauce of your life is to figure out that doing what you want to do is the game changer it, and, and and there and we fear that as women right because we're like oh i'll be too selfish i it'll my selfishness is going to harm other people and it's just like your selfishness is is you taking care of yourself so you have something to give to other people like how am i gonna like my friends if i don't like myself Come on, how am i yes. gonna love my child and my person if I don't love myself like and how do I get to the point where I like and love myself if I'm never doing anything that I want to do like how do you get there if 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 all I'm living are my needs or the needs of other people how in the world am I living if that's it if that's all I'm doing how in the world am I living you're I'm not and learning that there was a difference between surviving and living I was like I don't think anybody knows this I think people think that they're supposed to survive and it's just like based off everything that my ancestors did and I'm only surviving come on yeah that's I don't right. I, I don't want to dishonor <laughs> what they did in their survival mm -hmm. by just surviving now like even if I think if we don't have to be my ancestors it could just be my mama like based off what my mom has done I will not dishonor her by spending my life in survival mode aka not fulfilling and doing stuff that I want it is my basic responsibility to take care of my needs, but I'm supposed to rise to the occasion of doing what I want. That is, I, when I real, I was like, holy smokes, I'm supposed to do what I want. <laughs> like, yeah. blew my mind. That was, that is the thing that I learned this year. And it has been remarkable to see the ripple effect of positive outcomes and benefits for my friends, my family, my community, um, anyone that I've been called to serve and even just random people that I'm able to meet on the street. Like, because I do what I want, I interact with so many more human beings than ever before when I was running around doing what I should do or doing what I was supposed to do or doing what I had to do. It's like, these things don't have to be um, dichotomous, but they don't have to be, it doesn't have to be one or the other. They don't have to be mutually ex exclusive. You, it, it's fascinating how, how I'm able to meet my needs better now because I do what I want. 
And you know, it's what I talk about in my work all the time, like women showing up for themselves and figuring out what you want for your life and then doing that. The problem is so many of us do not know what we want. So we can't create a life because we have no idea. And it's like, oh, this person told me I should be doing this. This person told me I should be doing that. So you're living out all of these other people's lives, if you will. And you don't even know. You do not know. Right. This is where that journaling comes in because when I started to practice wanting and like fulfilling my wants, it started with me going back in my journals and me reading. I remember, I wish I would have pulled it. Um, I didn't know you were going to ask this question, but in my journal, I literally wrote down, I just want to take a bath with candles. Like I actually wrote that in my journal. Now think about that. Like for me to have to write that in my journal, that means I was so deprived in my regular life that I could not think through or process how to just take a bath with candles. Like that was this far off one day fantasy of just taking a bath with candles. And I had to be willing to write it down and then later go back and read it and then actually do it. And so what I tell a lot of people in terms of figuring out what they want, it's like, it doesn't have to be big. You don't have to want the yacht. You don't have to want an island. But like, do you want to wear nail polish? Like, Do you, like some people don't know if they want to wear nail polish. Like, do you want flowers? Mm -hmm. Some people don't, some people reject flowers. They're like, oh, I'm not a flower person because nobody's ever given you flowers. But that doesn't mean you don't want them. You've just never received them. And what doesn't mean that you have to have experienced it first. It's just pure desire. And I, all my simple wants, like to take a bath with candles, to paint my nails red, um, to, I really like, um, hotel pillows. I really like hotels in general. And I was just like, you know what? I want hotel pillows. So you know what I went, I went on Marriott shop, Marriott.com and I bought me some hotel, but like I did like it, your wants don't have to be something that like blows the bank. It yeah. could be you taking a bath with candles. Like the mm-hmm. first time I did that, I was like, Oh, this was a lot easier to do than I thought. <laughs> and then I trusted myself mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. go out and get my other wants, you know, like it's, And it's just, I I encourage any woman who's listening right now, if you can't rattle off 10 things that you want across the board in your life right now, like quickly, then I encourage you to get a journal and start journaling every day. What do you want? Like wake up in the morning and ask yourself that question. What do I want? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love how you said it doesn't have to be these grand big things, the simplicity of it, painting your nails red. Come on, anybody can go to Target and get a bottle of nail polish and paint their nails or, you know, taking a bath. We have water, you know. Right, like- and what's, what's crazy about painting my nails red is that, like, I just did it because, because um, like, so I grew up um, very religious and so we couldn't do that. And so that, that's a, it's a big deal. For, it's a big deal to paint my nails, but then to paint them red. Oh my gosh. You like know? a rebel, so, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and so I've always wanted it. But what's fascinating is... So I've been documenting my journey um, to become debt free over on my YouTube channel. And in most of my videos, my nails are red. And so sometimes when my nails aren't red, people will be like, oh, you know, I was hoping that your nails would be red. It's become a part. It's like a part of the story. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like how Carrie Bradshaw's fashion was a part of Carrie Bradshaw. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't realize that sometimes people can't see you because you're not doing the one, the thing that you want. And something as simple as me painting my nails red has become something a part of a view of me that people look forward to seeing so that they can hold on to the story of me repaying my debt. That Mm -hmm. is fascinating to me. Just, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying you wouldn't have followed without my nails being red, but the (laughs) fact that that's something that you're like, Oh, you know, Oh, you know, Stacy with the red nail. It's like, I didn't know that was a thing, Mm -hmm. but it's a thing because it's a desire fulfilled. That's why people can see it because you, when you're seeing it, you're seeing me fulfill a desire. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. why it looks so good or so different. Those little nuances, it's very simple wants fulfilled that will give people a beautiful picture of who you are and they'll love it. They'll be like, oh yeah, she does this or she wears this and you don't have to try. You just get to be. And they feel more connected to you. Yep. Because you have designed or you have created what you wanted for your life and you're allowing that to come through your work. And so Mm -hmm. now they feel like they know you and they're connected to you because you're showing up and becoming the best version of yourself. So I love how you said to get a journal and write down what do you want for your life and then start incorporating some of those practices, big or small. Yes. You will be surprised how easy it is to fulfill your wants. Mm -hmm. Like when I took that back, I said, what the, this was easy. Yeah. And, you, and it builds trust. And we don't, I think women don't trust themselves as much yes. as they would like to say that they do. Because yep. if you trusted yourself, it would, you wouldn't, when you hear the statement, 
I get to do what the fuck I want, it, it won't it won't make you shudder. If yep. you trust yourself, then you know that that's not a statement about doing anything bad, wrong, evil, or harmful to anybody else. I trust myself so much now that when I do what I want, I know that it's going to bring glory to any human being yes. that I come in contact with. Because I, I trust that. myself. Yes. I, I no that. longer see myself as bad or wrong or unlikable or unlovable. It's like, mm-mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so what are you most <laughs> proud of? Um, the thing that I'm most proud of right now is my son graduating from high school and going to college, um, earning a full ride scholarship to college. He is the first male in my family and his father's family to graduate high school and go to college. So I was the first female. He's the first male. And I mean, when I tell you I am uber proud, I am completely so, 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 so proud of him. And I'm, I'm proud because a part of him doing, like he's been able to do something that I thought, I don't know, I just thought it would take like his whole lifetime to do, but he's actually been able to make like a part of his dream or a piece of his dream come true and a piece of my dream come true. So like as a young mom, I just always dreamt that like I would raise him well enough to be able to make that transition into college because I think education in college is very, very important. And so it's been a dream for him to graduate and go to college. But he like took it to the next level and was like, and I'm going to get a full ride. So you don't got to worry about, you know, none of the financial part. And I'm going to get a full ride based off me playing football, which is a part of his dream. So one of his dreams used to be the, the to be the youngest player in the NFL with three businesses. And so he wanted to play ball all throughout college. So the fact that my son has been able to somehow realize his dream and my dream all at the same time, it just brings me so much pride. Like I am so stinking proud of him like I'm like kid like son mm -hmm. like you you are an incredible amazing human being like I love you to pieces like I'm just like just when I I mean I don't know even when I just think about his face I'm just like I'm so proud of you like you know he hasn't like like taken his first college class or anything yet but I'm just like you did this thing like there's so much of the world that said it was impossible for him to do you know his mom was a teen mom he's black in America like there's so many odds that were stacked against him and this little amazing incredible human being was like but I'm gonna do this thing anyway and I'm just super proud of him and he when I say he did it like he did it like he graduated from high school he earned the full ride scholarship he did the push-ups to get the you know he recovered um from his injuries like I'm just that is the thing I'm most proud of is just being his mom and successfully parenting him into this next phase of life, which is helping him to transition into manhood. And y'all, I wish y'all can see Stacy right now <laughs> <laughs> because she is glowing the way that she is expressing her love for her son. And I can only imagine how proud you are based yeah. on everything that you've done to get him to this point. And then not only graduate high school, but then to go to college, but have a full ride? Like, come on. Come on. Come on, full ride. Uh, yes, like. come on, full ride. Mm -hmm. And so this is not a question that you received, but this just came mm -hmm. up for me. Okay. Based on everything that you have done and in your life, like overcome so much, like how are you celebrating these accomplishments? Ooh. <laughs> I know it's hard. I know, friend. This is a hard question. So learning how to celebrate is new to me. Um, and we were talking on the phone about this. That's something that I'm actually learning how to do and I'm learning how to create a practice. So the same way that when I first started resting, it was new to me. Um, but I realized that rest is a complete spiritual practice and I dedicated myself to finding a rhythm and a ritual to it. That's what I'm trying to do with celebrating. And um, what we did um, on the phone, we journaled about it and I made a list of different things that I could buy myself to sort of mark the occasion when things have happened. Um, but I think the biggest thing is me first acknowledging that these things need to be celebrated yes. and then figuring out what my ritual for celebration is going to be. I think it's going to involve some sort of indulgence in <laughs> um, me buying things for myself, I think, but I don't know. I want to make it because I'm, I'm finding this is a very celebratory year for me. I'm, I'm hitting a lot of milestones. So I'm finding that I'm celebrating much more frequently than um, maybe years of the past. So I want some sort of thing that I always know that like when this happens, I can do it. So like, for example, when I have a speaking engagement, no matter where I'm having the speaking engagement, I always um, at the end of that evening, I go to the steakhouse in the city or country that invited me to speak. And I have like the best steak in all the land because I'm a steak girl and I love steak. So that's kind of the way that I celebrate sharing my words with the world. Um, but I want to figure out like what's something 
what's a practice that I can implement that every time I accomplish something or I'm proud of something that has been done that I can say, okay, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go to the spa for three days and you're going to, you know, something mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. that. I don't know what it is yet, but um, I'm, I'm learning. And so, so far I have a list of things to buy yes. for myself. <laughs> and the reason that I asked you that question is because it's so we can hold you accountable to this, right? So not just yes. me, but like mm-hmm. everyone that's listening, because you do need to celebrate. Like these are major yes. milestones and yeah, I'm guilty. I'm not, I don't have it mm-hmm. all together. You already know. So I too have yeah. to learn how to celebrate. And I think we all do. Cause even when I ask yeah. this question in my community in the be free inner circle, like how do you guys celebrate? Like that is a struggle for women because mm-hmm. we don't have time to celebrate. We're always yeah. doing mm-hmm. other things, but we do have to press pause and think like, how am I going to acknowledge this mm-hmm. moment and not let it just be another thing? Would you saying that what that made me think of is like, if it was a kid, how would I celebrate my kid? So Mm -hmm. what I'm going to probably do when we get off this call is I'm going to journal about if my son were to accomplish the things that I've accomplished within this year, what would I have done for him? And I'm just going to overlay those onto me and see what fits. Because I think when I think about it from the perspective of celebrating him, I'm like, oh, where's the party at? There's a party that definitely needs to be happening, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, I'm going to do that. That that's very helpful. Oh, I love that. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. See, we got somewhere. We got somewhere, yeah, right? We did. <laughs> yes. Okay. So what makes you feel inspired or like your best self? Ooh, these are, these are good questions. Um, so as of late, probably the, the three things that are keeping me the most inspired and making me feel like my best self, um, uh, number one going on right now is my person. Um, he keeps me very inspired. He, he's always been someone who I felt very seen and heard around. And so he keeps me, um, whether he's trying to or not, like his just existence makes me feel deeply inspired and much like my best self all the time. Um, I have some amazing and supportive friends like, oh my gosh, like I have, I, I mean, I was going to say y'all should be jealous, but that's not fair. No, you shouldn't. But I, I have they some, should really, be. I, think they should. <laughs> I have some amazing and supportive friends. And I mean, when it comes to being my best self, it's like, they are the perfect atmosphere environment cre- creators. Like they just, they are awesome. So they keep me very much inspired. Um, and most of my friends now we're in um, very similar places in our lives emotionally. We're not in similar places in our lives, um, like naturally with, with respect to like children and spouses and things like that. But emotionally, um, we're all in the same space. And so I get a lot of inspiration from just witnessing them work through uh, emotional challenges or emotional um, curiosities that I haven't yet come upon, but I'll probably be upon within like the weeks or whatever. So it's, it feels good to to share an emotional space with some really incredible women. Um, and then, uh, the last thing that keeps me really inspired is my work. Like my work, I just, it's gone to a, uh, it's grown exponentially in the last, um, maybe six to nine months. And so I'm deeply inspired by it because my community is, is asking from me things that I've always wanted to give, but they're asking in such a way that like, it just really inspires me to say, you know what? Yes, I will create this, whether they're DMing me, you know, a personal message about what they're going through or emailing me or just coming up to me when I'm getting off stage or, you know, sending up the hearts when I'm doing the IG live. It's, it's, it's fascinating to have built a community that is specifically asking for the things that I've always wanted to create. So they, they are keeping me deeply, deeply inspired. Um, so yeah, I would say those three things, my person, my amazing and supportive friends and my work. I love that. So since you brought up friends, how important mm-hmm. is sisterhood and community to you? Ooh, that's a good one. So I'm just, I'm gonna be perfectly honest. It used to not be important to me. It actually used to really be a burden, mm-hmm. um, both community and sisterhood. Sisterhood was an incredible burden because I had so much trauma around sisterhood because I had lost one of my sisters very early on in life um, and then went to foster care and you know my sisters and I were separated. So I had a lot of trauma around what it means to be someone's sister and what it means to have more sisters. And so it just was an incredible burden to think about adding women to my life who I would call sister. I just could not do it successfully. Um, And then the same thing with community, because there was so much turbulence in my early childhood. And then 
um, even as I matured and I went through different communities, whether it was me, you know, um, going to different colleges or um, being in different organizations, there was there was a lot of turbulence. Um, or, well, not turbulence. There was just a lot of confusion around how do you exist in a community without um, losing your identity within that community. So both community and sisterhood were just all, they always just felt like burdens because I just, I couldn't handle the capacity. I couldn't handle the threat to my identity. And I felt like letting you become my sister or letting or being fully a part of this community was a full blown threat to my identity. Um, Through much healing, um, trauma work, different things like that, I was able to heal some wounds around the sister stuff and some wounds around the community stuff and really get to a place where I know who I am um, and know that I'm an asset to any community and I'm an I'm an asset to any sort of sisterhood and get to the place where the significance of them are that I know now I wouldn't be who I am without sisterhood and community. Mm -hmm. So even though for majority of my life, it felt like a burden, I'm a thousand percent for sure. I wouldn't be who I am without community. And so like, for example, over on my YouTube channel, when I first started documenting my journey to become hundred percent debt free, I think I had about 2000 or so people that were subscribed to me. It is way more than 2,000 or so Mm -hmm. people now. But when I turned to them, I was turning to a community to hold me accountable to my financial goal. And if they weren't there, I would not be where I am financially right now. Like those people being like, hey, you said you were going to tell us your budget. You told us you weren't going to spend your money here. Those people saying, hey, this is what you said in this video. And this is what you, them saying, well, what did you eat? If this is all you spent, what did you eat? If this is all you spent, then what are you wearing? them holding me accountable forced me to have to live in integrity with what I was saying. Like that can't be done without community. Mm -hmm. Like you need multiple people reminding you of who you are so that in those weak moments or in those um, dark moments or in those hard moments, you don't forget that community over on YouTube is the reason why my finances are where they are now like period point blank hands down yes i'm a student of dave ramsey's financial peace university and it was a it's a beautiful map and it gave me a path but i wouldn't have succeeded in following that path without this community so it's so significant to me you know and even sisterhood when i think about my sorority sisters are my my friends my amazing and supportive friends who are fast becoming sister like to me it's like i need that level of intimacy mm-hmm. to where i feel almost like i'm with my chosen family cuz in that level of intimacy when i'm looking at them and i'm seeing myself reflected i feel like i'm at home mm-hmm. and if i'm at home then i'm safe and if i'm safe then i get to be and if i get to be then watch out world cuz You know, like if when we're just being like, that's the point, right? So it's significant to say the least. Yeah. And it's so beautiful. No, you definitely answered my question. And it's so beautiful. And I talk about friendship all the time. Um, More recently, you know, over the last couple of months, based on everything that I have been, I went through with the breakup or whatever. But Mm -hmm. now that I'm very clear on the type of friends that I need and want in my life, Mm -hmm. like you, they feel like home. Like, it's almost like, because you were saying in the beginning, like people should be jealous. They should be jealous. Like if they could just, <laughs> and I don't want, not, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but if you look at your friends that are in your life and they're not adding value to your life and there's no support there and you just feel like they're not who you need them to be, that's a problem for me because mm-hmm. I value friendship and it's very, very important. And so you don't, if yeah. you don't have the right people in your life like that, it totally sucks because mm-hmm. you need it. You need yeah, it. Definitely and so need it. how would you say that you support and show up for your friends? Mm, I think the the biggest thing that I do for my friends is that I'm non-judgmental. So all of my friends know that all of their thoughts, their feelings, their actions, their experiences are safe to be expressed with me. You can you can tell me anything. Any woman in my circle knows that every thought, feeling, action, whatever is going to be accepted with love. Like she just knows that I... I don't have any judgment in that regard. Like I, it is the, there's just no judgment whatsoever. And in me being non-judgmental, I think the way that that translates into support is that I'm able to hold space for really difficult things and really beautiful things all at the same time. So like, for example, a friend could be going through like something dark and devastating, but because I'm not judging her, it doesn't matter. Like I'm not holding that against her 
in this moment, this next moment where we're about to celebrate something else that's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of friendships, because there is judgment, like you could be having a winning season and a dark moment and your friend will hold you to the dark moment that shades your winning season. And it's just like, no, I have capacity to hold space for both of that. I have enough cognitive flexibility to be like, I see you winning right here, even though this is hurting right here. Like I'm totally like, I have space for that. And I think that that's the most supportive thing that you can do is not judge a woman for the way that she feels or the way that she thinks, or even the way that she behaves. And so many people are like, well, if you know, if you don't judge it, then how do people change? How, how are you going to help them? How, it's like you help them by allowing them to be trusting that in you allowing them to be safe with you and be seen with you, that they will get up when they are capable of getting up. Mm -hmm. They will do the work when they are capable of doing the work. Like I trust my friends to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And if they can't take care of themselves, we have built um, enough rapport and trust and love that they'll ask for help. Yeah. And if, and if, and if they, they're in a space where, you know, they can't get up and they're not asking for help, we have built a solid enough foundation where it's safe for me to ask the question, hey, do you need something from me right now that you're not asking for? Because I would love to be able to help you right now. And for her to respond without it being like, why do you think I need you? Which <laughs> we don't have that in my friend, my friendship yeah. group. So I think that I support women by just not being judgmental and holding space for the fullness of who they are. I, I love my friend so much. Yeah. And I mm-hmm. love that. And that's so important because that judgmental piece, listen, that is like, it's hard because then you can't be your full self and you know yeah. people are judging you, even your closest friends based on how you're showing up in that friendship. So I love that you make space and that you don't hope people, like you don't judge people based on what they're going through or anything like that. I love that. Everybody's on a journey. Like yes. if, if you happen yeah. to be in this ugly part of your journey why would I judge you for that I'm gonna love you for getting through it like nobody knows what people are going through like you don't know what this woman dealt with that is causing her to act this way so why would you why would you judge that like mm -mm, no yeah I agree I agree so what's one thing you would tell your 20 year old self (laughs) um I would tell my 20 year old self that you are right Every crazy hunch, intuitive hit, thought, or like, because I think when I was younger, I used to, I I see now that I'm older, people are like, oh, you have so much insight and wisdom. That sort of thing has always been there, but I've always second guessed it. I'm like, oh, I don't know. That doesn't make sense to other people. No, listen, 20 year old self, (laughs) your gut is right, period. Believe that. Believe that over everything. Believe that over every slice of evidence or proof that anybody will ever show to you. What your gut is telling you, young Stacy, is a thousand and fifty million percent right. You are right. And you will see that proof as you get older, but you don't need that proof. Just go follow that. Follow that. Follow your intuition. Follow your gut. You are not wrong. And I think, man my 20 year old self and throughout all of my 20s, I just felt like I was so wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's just because I had insight before my time about so many different things. And it sucked. And I think if if one person in my life would have said, you know, you're right, you're right about that, then it would have given me more peace. So that's what Mm -hmm. I would tell her is that she is absolutely right. I I believe you. I would say that I would tell her I believe you. Oh, man, that's what I would tell her. I would tell you, Stacey, I believe you. Cause didn't nobody, nobody believe me. And that really hurt my feelings. I would, t- I believe you, Stacey, 20 year old Stacey. Mm-hmm. I love that. Don't, don't have me crying. On I know. Mind. And I feel, I feel, <laughs> I can feel it. I can feel it coming up. Um, what advice would you give to someone just starting out with changing their life? Mm-hmm. I would say that you are the average of the five people that you choose to associate with the most. Right. And those people need to be your cheerleader, your mentor, your coach, your friend, and your peer. And I talk about this in my TED Talk, but the reason why I say that is because if you are on a path to changing your life, I want to tell you ahead of time, there are going to be some moments that completely suck. But when you have a cheerleader, when you have a mentor, when you have a coach, when you have a true friend and a peer in your life, 
they are the people who shine the right kind of light on you to help you get out of that space. And changing your life comes with its fair share of suckiness and you need the right kind of support, right? But it's also the same thing that when you change your life, the celebrations are beautiful Mm -hmm. and you want the right kind of people around you. And that cheerleader, that mentor, that coach, that friend and the peer, those are the right kind of people. If you are the average of the people that you're associating with the most and you are about to change your life, look to people's lives that you respect and admire. Look to people's lives that just when you imagine switching places with them, it doesn't make you go, no, it makes you go, okay, if I had to, because what's going to happen is those people are going to support you and advise you and encourage you and motivate you and push you from the experiences that they have. And if you are, if you improve your average, if you improve those people that you're spending the most time with, your life naturally elevates. There's an aspect of changing your life where you won't have to use hard work. You'll just be able to show up and, and be guided and lifted by them. So that's what I would say. I would say right now, run, make a list in your journal of who your five people are. I love it. And I'll make sure that I link to your TED talk in the show notes so people can go take a look at that because it was so inspirational. And it's like, oh, wait, I'm missing some people in my life. Like I have this person, this person, but I'm missing a few. So I think it was, it is, it's really, really helpful. And it's a great guide to figure out, okay, what type of people do I need to put in certain places? So you know what you need for that support. So that's really, really good. Um, Because we get things from different people. Like we think that we're supposed to get everything from one person. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. That's how you wear people out. That's why people need rest. Right. Mm -hmm, No, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have different people in our lives who gives us different things. And I think understanding the type of person in the role really, really supports you in not wearing yourself out, not wearing the person out, not being disappointed. Mm -hmm. Um, It just really, really supports you in getting what it is that you want and creating the life that you want. Yes, because that's the goal, right? That is the goal. That's the goal. Um, What book would you highly recommend the Girl Be Free listeners read? And I know you mentioned Louise Hay. You Mm -hmm. can hear your life, so I'll definitely link to that. But what's another book, like hands down, that everyone should read? Everyone should read Worthy by Nancy Levine. It's Worthy. The subtitle is uh, Boost Your Self-Worth to Increase Your Net Worth, I believe. Um, It's a book about money, but it's a book that has a lot of work in it about money. And the reason why I say that, especially for women, is because one of the things that has been super profound for me as I have restored my financial dignity and really moved into a beautiful financial place is that I have found aspects of myself that I did not have access to because I just couldn't afford to have them, right? Mm -hmm. So there were feelings that I just wouldn't let myself have because I couldn't afford to have those feelings. Like, Imagine not being afford to have your feelings. That's I lived in that space. And I think so many women are not free and they're not fulfilled and they're not flourishing in their life because they, they literally can't afford to do it. And I'm not talking about the afford to just go get your nails done. I'm talking about affording to be able to have your feelings. I went through a grief season. Grief is rough. Ooh. And because I was financially secure, I could afford yes. to properly grieve. Mm -hmm. Right. Like some of us aren't grieving that last person who did whatever or this job or whatever, because we can't afford to pause and curl up in the bed and cry about it. I can afford to grieve. Right. Not Mm -hmm. only can I afford to grieve, I can afford to be joyous. And so many of us can't afford to be joyous. Like we can't afford to go and buy something to celebrate ourselves. And so if there was any book that I would recommend for your audience, it would be that book because she She tells the story of understanding that your worthiness is inherent, but the reflection of that is reflected in your finances because your finances gives you the ability to be able to do the things in your life that make you feel worthy all the time. Mm -hmm. And and women, we need that. We need that financial dignity. We need that financial understanding. And I want that for you. Because I want you guys to be able to afford to have your feelings. (laughs) Come on. Yeah. And, you know, I just recently learned about my feelings over the last, I don't know, year or more um, because I did not. And I didn't even know that I couldn't afford my feelings. I wasn't even taught to feel. I just went through the motions. Mm -hmm. Like, so if you ask me a question, like, how do you feel? I'm like, oh, I don't know. If it ain't happy or sad or angry, I don't know everything in between. But now I have become a lot better. Most women, they don't even have happy or sad. They don't even have the top five. They'll tell you what they think. You ask the woman how Mm -hmm. she feels, she'll tell you what she thinks. Yes. (laughs) Yes. That's Mm -hmm. so true. 
And I'm really good at being like, okay, let me, t- you ask me how I feel. Let me tell you this. And then we could put that together um, and you help me express what I feel. So yeah, you're so right. And I hope that people will start to acknowledge like, yeah, I feel like this and this is why and start to do the work around that. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So share a fun fact about yourself. <laughs> Okay. What? Um, <laughs> I don't know why this is. Listen, I'm okay. The funnest fact about me is that I'm actually fun. This is something that we've talked about is that like so many people have this impression of me that I am like this very professional, maybe little uptight type person, but like, no guys, I'm a blast. I'm a whole entire ball. So that's probably the funnest fact is that the me that you see in my work is very much a a portion of who I am, but it is also very much work. And just as deeply and 150 million percent that I put into my work, I put that into my play as well. So, or my fun as well. So I'm the funnest person in all the land. That's a fun fact. (laughs) I love that. I love that. I love that. And tell me, what does being free mean to you? Mm, um, I think being free means being myself like Mm. it is literally it is me unapologetically and confidently and loudly being myself Mm. that's what being free the loud is important because for so much of my life I didn't feel seen or heard and I'm beginning I I'm I feel very free now and I feel like it's because I'm allowing myself to be loud um, and not just loud in volume, I'm talking about loud in terms of reach and impact, mm-hmm. right? It's mm-hmm. it's fascinating that a million people have seen something that I've created. That's very loud, yeah. right? So Can we I celebrate. To- Wait a minute. You know how I get. <laughs> Let's pause. A million people have a seen million? your TED Talk? Yeah. A I million didn't people. That. It just, it, I, just, I was like, whoa. Yeah. That, how does that make you feel? Look at me. Incredible. Like on the phone. <laughs> um, it, I feel very satisfied. Like I feel very, it makes me very happy. Like all I ever wanted was for people to understand that idea, right? Like that, like, cause you know, Ted talks are based on like sharing one idea and the fact that a million people have now been introduced to that idea. I feel very satisfied with myself, like personal satisfaction on 10 right now. Like, sure. yes. Um, so, so yeah, like, yeah, that's, that's what I mean by loud, not necessarily value, but like impact. So that's what being free for me is because my voice is really connected to my freedom and it is very loud right now. And I'm just, that's how, you know, I'm free. Oh, I love that. That is a really, (laughs) really good answer. This was amazing. And I just want to show gratitude for even taking time out of your schedule to have a conversation with me. And it was so beautiful, which I knew that it would be based on our connection, our energy or what have you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a part. Yes. And so tell everyone, where can they find you? Um, You can find me everywhere on the internet at Stacy Flowers. And that's S-T-A-C. E-Y, and then flowers spelled like a bouquet of roses. Love that. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much. And until next time, girl, be free. Hey, BFFs. I want to personally invite you to BeFreeInnerCircle.com, your community for real sisterhood where women are showing up and doing the work. Whether you're still trying to figure out what you want to be when you grow up or you need accountability to keep pushing forward to reach your goals, the Be Free Inner Circle is the community for you. You can expect curated content that will support you on becoming the best version of yourself, live office hours and Q&A sessions where we chat about things like overcoming self-doubt, building your confidence, practicing self-care without guilt, and so much more. Virtual live events from book clubs and workshops with guest speakers and a supportive and active community of women that will encourage you hold you accountable, cheer you on, and give you honest feedback and advice. It's the perfect place to be for women who are ready to show up, flourish, and be free. Join today at BeFreeInnerCircle.com.